So, so if you look at handloom industry, the reason why it's pretty interesting is that it employs millions of people across. Well, actually, you know, millions of family, uh, families, but they're about um, 32 odd lakh workers. And then if you add those who are uh, working in and towards making these 35 lakh looms work, you can see it's a very large sector. It's said it is the second largest um, employer after agriculture. And the production is interesting because producers, production uh, um, is done by weavers or producers across various clusters with very unique techniques and aesthetics. So cluster A has a kind of technique and aesthetic, which is so different from another cluster that you're looking at Kanchipuram and um, let's say Patola or uh, Pochambali. And each of these clusters have techniques that are different, aesthetics that are different. And broadly, there are two kinds of weavers. Those who are independent, which means that they buy the raw material from the market, make products and sell them back to the market. So those are independent weavers. I think about 70, 73 or percent of weavers are uh, independent, or those who work for intermediaries. When we, when we say intermediaries, there are three kinds of intermediaries. At one level, they're cooperatives, and then second, they're NGOs and social enterprises, uh, and the third are master weavers. So these are the intermediaries who pick the product up from the producers and take them to wherever the markets are, right? Could be uh, in the same district, in the same state, uh, um, in the same region, or right across the nation as well. So the demand for these products are across the nation, but the production are kind of clustered. So you need intermediaries to uh, take the product from wherever it is being produced to wherever it is being consumed, right? So when we say master weavers, who are these people? So master weaver is kind of a generic term. So it's not like the master craftsmen of the guilds or master craftsmen construct that was existing elsewhere, where you are talking about the skill set that you're a master craftsman because you're able to do things that many of the people who are uh, living around you would not be able to do. Therefore, you are considered a master craftsman. But master weaver is a much more generic term and it refers to for-profit individuals or firm who supply raw material and yarn to weavers, pay them wages and market the product. So they have an intermediary role, but they are the ones who take decisions about what, what to get made. And they are the ones who take decisions about where to sell it. And by and large, they are the ones who also take uh, the risk in case something doesn't go properly, right? So, um, so if you look at the industry, how is it structured? There are about 35 lakh, 35 lakh people are involved in the handloom industry across the country. Of this, 73% are independent weavers, as I mentioned earlier, but most of them are in northeastern part of India. And then they are they produce either for domestic or sell in the uh, local markets. 63% work for cooperatives and 1% work for KVIC and other handloom roles. So put together about 7.3% 7 7 of the weavers work for cooperatives. Right? But master weaver segment supports about 5 lakh weavers in rural areas and close to 22 lakh people in urban areas, right? Almost about 20% of all the weavers um, uh, are supported by the master weaver segment compared to 6.3 for cooperatives that maybe add, add some more for NGOs. So significantly large number of people find employment under this segment. So, so, so and, and these again, as I mentioned, are independent entrepreneurs who are taking money from the financial markets, taking the risk in developing the products and then selling them. So, um, uh, the thing is, although nearly 7 lakh weavers are supported through the master weaver segment, very little is known about them in the academic circles. And um, so, so, so most academic studies focused on cooperatives, NGOs, or the governmental policies like reservation, like uh, housing, like uh, health card. 
So there are lots of policy level decisions that the government has taken, but by and large only reach to the uh, um, 2.3% of the people who are with the cooperatives. It's actually quite a murky situation because some of those, they keep the cooperative card just to get governmental benefits, but they may actually end up working with the master waivers because not all cooperatives are able to provide work continuously through the year. Even NGOs, there are not very many NGOs are able to provide 365 or even 340 days of support for weavers um, uh, through the year, right? So there are not many entities that are able to provide work continuously. Therefore, the weavers move between all the three intermediaries. So the same weaver would be working for the master weaver, could also be picking up some products from NGO, or could be working for a, a social enterprise or an individual uh, uh, NGO as well, right? So they end up doing all of these things. So what are the kind of academic works that exist in hand -loom, right? Based on, uh, so Marx in 19, 1853 wrote an article how British continuously uh, uh, de-industrialized India, saying that before British came in, India was fairly advanced in terms of the kind of uh, um, the global GDP and the kind of industry that it had. But after uh, uh, Britain came in, we have Britain has eroded a large part of India's uh, industry and therefore uh, had a very critical article about how uh, British deindustrialized India. So based on this and lots of uh, critical voices, uh, British government early 1900s started to work on developing uh, handloom sector and they started creating uh, cooperatives. And they said, we need to create cooperatives. And that was also the time where they were doing something called uh, uh, food for work program. And they realized that the weavers were not joining the food for work program because they were very scared that their hands will become very hard and therefore will not be able to come back and work on uh, 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 the, the, the looms, right? Even, even apparently in Europe and in uh, America, the last set of people to leave their traditional trade were weavers because they were very scared by going and doing something else. They may not come back into this particular sector once again. So, so, so even today, there's a large debate going on about how uh, the kind of deindustrialization that may have worked in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, the British policies, right? Ah, okay, so this was the first one. So you have people, Arneti and Bakchi and some of them have continued to talk about deindustrializing. And based on that, government has formed cooperatives and cooperatives had lots of purpose. And today, the lots of um, uh, uh, studies, the books have been written studying the cooperatives, right? Why are they working? Why are they not working? What is happening to them? And things like that. So major thrust of academic work in Handloom has been why uh, uh, governmental policies are supporting uh, uh, cooperatives or not supporting cooperatives. And there is enough and more on this particular topic. So the third, third area of interest for scholars has been understanding the overall picture of the industry, either in the past or in the present. So there's quite a bit of work. So, so in a way, right, for a lot of historians, I feel history kind of ended with 1947. So you do, you see a lot of studies in the uh, uh, 13th century, 15th century, uh, uh, 18th century, 19th century. But then by the time it comes to 1947, we don't see much work between 1947 and current. So uh, 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 recent history, doesn't exist. We seem to know a lot about what happened in the past, but we really don't know much about what happened subsequent to our um, uh, uh, independence. And I think that is uh, a, a segment that is 
right for research. What has happened to handloom sector post independence? How did the cooperative movement come or how did something like festivals of India revive the interest in handloom? How have entities like uh, a Fab India and works of Kamala Dev Chattopadhyay and uh, Marthan Singh has revoked uh, 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 markets for handlooms. Quite a bit that needs to be done, which hasn't been done at all. So academic work on master weavers has been quite little. It's not that it didn't, doesn't exist. There are folks who have studied. Uh, Cable and Jane have studied uh, uh, how do they work, what do they do. Uh, Mukund and Sundari have actually done quite an interesting work. I think this is the last piece of comprehensive work that has been published in Handloom, uh, it's current Handloom. And so it's been 20 years since this book has been published. And perhaps it's time for some scholars to look at what has happened over the last 20 years in terms of this particular sector. But uh, Mukund and Sundari have also studied Handloom uh, uh, master weavers in order to figure out how do they work. And um, uh, Suran, Sundari and Niranjana have done. And then they at all have a paper in 2008 to figure out uh, how, how has uh, some of the uh, um, wages changed. And what, what, what some of the scholars have found out is that cooperatives per se may not be helping a lot, but wherever there is a strong cooperative, it seemed to help the wages of the weavers seem to be stable and much higher and, and, and it, it forms a healthy competition to the master weavers. So kind of, so kind of um, uh, 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 counterbalancing the force of master weavers. So why do I think there's lack of research, right? So the lack of research could be because it's implicitly assumed by policymakers as well as researchers that master weavers being private entrepreneurs are exploitative in nature while cooperatives being public institutions are good. So that to me is a little bit simplistic because If the criticism against the master weavers is that they pay low wages to our weavers or that they're exploitative in nature, they must be commended for providing continuous employment to lakhs of weavers for decades, right? So how are they doing it? If you compare them to uh, working of cooperators, master weavers are able to produce products which are so much more marketable compared to uh, 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 cooperators because cooperators are finding it difficult without giving subsidy. Uh, without giving uh, a rebate. People are not going to walk into a cooperative store. And we're doing some research in terms of how do handloom stores work and how do cooperative stores work. And there's a huge difference in terms of how they present themselves, how they attract clients and things like that. So my research work on handloom is like over three separate segments. First has been looking at the social network perspective. Another, I tried working a bit on uh, clusters to see how I can use Handloom as a context to study some of these clusters, especially those clusters and evolution of clusters. Um, that really didn't work out well, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm currently trying to understand aesthetic marketplaces and category creation again using Handloom. So what does the social network perspective say? The social network perspective in entrepreneurship says that networks help entrepreneurs find opportunities, mobilize resources, getting referrals, and getting legitimacy, right? So networks have been very instrumental in providing support to um, uh, uh, um, entrepreneurs. So how has structural analysis in terms of what is the network that entrepreneurs are embedded in, in terms of who they speak to and who they interact with, and how does that support or uh, uh, constrain entrepreneurship is what network perspectives is. And I was like trying to see how this works out in handling industry. 
because um, uh, one set of scholars say that um, uh, um, so one set of scholars saying say that if networks where of entrepreneurs where people know each other that there is a interconnected uh, a strongly interconnected network with strong ties are argued to be a helpful to entrepreneurs because they provide trust and resources and on the other side you have um, people who say that access to private and new information is a source of competitive advantage because that is where they find uh, 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 opportunities. So they say access to private information resides in networks where there are few indirect contacts because uh, you need new information and new information comes from a network where people don't know each other. That's when you end up being uh, more, uh, 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 what I would say, uh, um, uh, um, so, so, so in a way, it would be more advantages for you to find opportunities. So I looked at this, I tested the network debates in entrepreneurship within the handloom industry, because I argued that the, the advantage that one master weaver's success, the advantage is that one master weaver's success does not depend on access to technology or skilled talent that come and work for them, but it's the network he nurtures, networks of suppliers, networks of stores that he goes and gives products to, how he gets information back from them in order to figure out what is selling, what is not selling. This kind of helps him in uh, identifying uh, 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 good opportunities. So therefore, I kind of argued that Handloom would be a good context to study networks. And um, 